You are listening to Be Amplified, the podcast with Brie and Thais, episode number 18. Hey, Amplifiers, welcome to Be Amplified, the podcast. My name is Thais. And I'm Bree Seely. We are the co-founders of the Amplified Collective, a movement aimed at radically disrupting how purpose-driven women connect and operate in the world. Because we believe it's not just what you do, but who you are that matters. Each week, join us for messages and interviews that will leave you feeling amplified and ready to change the world. Let's do this. Hola at your mother. Oh, hey, amplifiers. Hey, hey, ladies and gent. Uh, we are going to be talking today about uh, getting uncomfortable and what on earth are people going to think about me? Mm, people you know, pleasers. People pleasers. You know, I think women in general, uh, well, men and women, but I can only speak for women. Uh, I can only speak for myself, really. Uh, I you know, it's it's very much at the forefront of my mind. What are people going to think about me? What are people going to say? Or or are they going to like this? That's a big one. Are they going to like this? Um, Seeking approval. Yes, validation. Um, and uh, yeah, we're going to dive into this topic a little bit today and share some of our insights on what we can do to make sure that we're living a life on our terms as uncomfortable and badass as possible uh, without worrying about what other people are thinking about what we're doing. Yeah, and we have such a brilliant guest with us today. I'm really excited to introduce you guys to uh, Billy Anderson later in the episode. He's uh, he's a pretty pretty badass guy that gets uncomfortable a lot. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> and I think that, that that just goes to show that, guess what? You don't die by getting uncomfortable because he's alive. You know, our fears, as much as they feel very real, are not going to kill us by doing the opposite of what our fear tells us to do. So let's talk about people pleasing, Brie. Let's start let's start off there. I feel like like I only have this to a very small degree. I know you're pretty good at this. I'm pretty good at not giving a fuck what other people think of okay, me. Okay, can you show you the fuck story <laughs> because <laughs> because you uh, shared this to our coterie members only beach brunch a few weeks ago and I thought it was so funny and epic how you shared it. And so Let's dive into the fuck story. Hopefully I won't have a coughing fit like I did in the middle of it <clears throat> at the beach brunch. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I've always kind of been a person. And of course, to a degree, I have certain situations where I give a fuck. But for the most part, like in, so in high school, for example, I, um, I would wear whatever the fuck I wanted and I never cared what anyone said about me. Like, People said some crazy ass shit to me about what I wore, and I never cared. I would wear one of my favorite pairs of pants when I was in high school was this pair of, like, plastic leather oh my God. glitter. Like, <laughs> so cool. much. So they were, like, you know, tight pleather. Also, this was in the 90s. Tight pleather <laughs> pants, and I would wear them to high school. I just thought they were the coolest. Of course, most people wore them to, like, nightclubs and raves and whatever, but I fucking wore them to class because I didn't care. And even little things, like I would wear um, kerchiefs in my hair. And the vice principal actually pulled me out of class one day and threatened to send me home because it was a gang symbol. Oh this was, God. you know, back in the 90s when everyone had the handkerchiefs and you couldn't wear the handkerchiefs. But mine was like pink gingham with like a little lace detail at the edge. And it was literally <laughs> just a triangle, so it would just fit in your hair. And uh, he pulled me out of class one day and was like, I'm going to have to send you home because that's a gang symbol. And I basically looked at him and said, awesome, my mom will love to receive that phone call and so will our lawyers. So by all means, please send me home. You are so bold. Okay, here's my my quick high school story. I cared very much what people thought of me and I desperately wanted to be cool desperately like I would have done pretty much anything to be cool however what stopped me from doing anything to be cool is that I also simultaneously have a deep desire to be different than anybody else and so I was in a pretty perplexing situation where I wanted to be I was proud of being different and having my own differences and wanting to be unique and special simultaneously wanting to be like everybody else anyway keep going Brie so Needless to say, he did not send me home. That's school. amazing. I would never, I, I, I would have just cried and gone home. But no, not Bree Seely. <laughs> so, you know, I've kind of, I've never, I, like I said, I have my moments where I'm people pleasing, whatever. But 
for the most part, I kind of do my own thing. I walk to my own drum, beat my own drum, whatever. But one of our, um, our, our former coach used to say to us this, this policy of the zero, zero fucks policy. And essentially she would say, you know, on any given day, you get X amount of fucks. So say on any given day, you, you get 10 fucks. You wake up every single morning and you have 10 fucks to give that day. So say you're driving to work and someone cuts you off and you get all upset about it and you give three fucks. <laughs> so all of a sudden it's what, 9 a.m. and you only have seven left to give. And then, you know, your boss gets angry at you at work or something and you give another two fucks. And then it's maybe noon and you only have five left to give. But say like your daughter or your best friend or someone you care deeply about is having some big event that night and you want to give all of your fucks to them that night. And you you very quickly realize what it looks like to make things important in your life and what you're willing to give a fuck about and what you're not willing to give a fuck about. Because you only have, a, I mean, the point of the story is that you only have so much energy. Yeah. You only have so much time and uh, energy to to give fucks about. And so if you use up all your fucks on the irrelevant stuff, that someone cutting you off, the what do people care, then you don't have the fucks to give to what the things that matter. Yeah, so if you're spending all your time sitting around and being like, oh, what's so-and-so going to think or... What's my mom going to say or what's this or what's that or da 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 all of a sudden you could give all 10 of your fucks within 10 minutes and then be screwed for the rest of the day because you have nothing left to care about for the rest of the day the good stuff or the bad stuff yeah i mean i you know will say that one of the things that my dad has said to me is Thais, you would be so much more successful if you stopped cussing if you just stop cussing, your success level would just go through the roof. Pause. I'm realizing that we've said the F word a lot in this podcast. Yes. Keep going. And uh, <laughs> as, as much as I completely honor, respect, put on a pedestal, adore my father, I don't give a fuck. You know, this is this is who I am. And I've found that by cussing, I'm able to express my passion and my commitment to life in a greater way. It's a way that I feel that I'm being real and that I'm being truthful. And that's the feedback that I've received. And so I have had to be very strategic about whose advice I let into my life. And here's what I do. If this is a business decision, I will ask people who have what I want. So if I want to make a, um, you know, if I, if I want to have a, a three video launch campaign, I'm not going to ask my mom about it because as much as I love my mom, she has literally no experience in this apartment. I'm going to ask the people who have been there and done that and is where I want to be. Makes sense. And so I'm very strategic about who's, who, who's fuck I give about any particular subject. Because why am I going to let someone who has literally no idea what they're talking about and who doesn't even live the life I want to live to dictate what I do in my life and in my business? Mm -hmm. And so that's one way that I've been able to kind of moderate and determine the fucks that I give is that I'm strategic about who I ask advice from. And when people give me advice that I didn't really ask for, I'm, I very much go within me and ask myself where I'm not believing in myself. Because if I were to truly present myself in a way where I believed in myself, I do not believe that people would give me advice. People give advice to those that they think are not doing that well. Mm -hmm. Right. Like you don't give advice to someone who's who's flourishing and succeeding because you don't think that they need it. And so if I'm receiving advice, it means that I'm somehow putting off the the energy that I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. So let's shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, getting uncomfortable, because I sure. know this is a big thing that we'll be talking with Billy about. So, um, Thais. Well, and it's, it's very much also aligned with with people pleasing, because oftentimes we, it's we don't. Uncomfortable it's to, uncomfortable to to break away from th doing what people think we should be doing. Yeah. yeah. And to set boundaries. Yeah. So, Thais, what's the uh, what's the most uncomfortable thing you've done in the last month? Hmm. That is a fantastic question. I think. I think when it comes down to it, one of the most uncomfortable things that I have done is really claimed my desire to be of service to the world through my three-day transformational leadership intensive that I'm hosting in November. And here's why. When I first launched it, 
Uh, my first one was this past March, and I May. had oh May, wow May, yeah. Uh, the first one I had was in May, and I had so much resistance in the launching period of it. So much resistance. So much resistance. It like, was like a daily Thais, you're not quitting. Yeah, I don't know why I experienced so much. I mean, I do know why, but I experienced so much resistance in in leading up to that event and I kept wanting to quit. I kept wanting to be like, nope, not doing it. It's still not too late. I can still quit. I could still not make this happen. And Brie almost every day would remind me, Thais, shit or get off the pot shit or get off the pot and I'm like no I'm committed I'm doing this I want to put this into the world shit or get off the pot every single day and it ended up being the best three-day weekend of my entire life I've never I've never led anything like that it was the most transformational experience for me and for the people who are attending and so I decided in the middle of the second the first one that I was going to have a second one in 2016 even though I only want to do it once a year I knew I had to do it again this year and do it in a bigger way and so one of the most uncomfortable things that I've been really committing to is showing up in this three-day intensive in a huge huge way like blowing up how many people I want in attendance blowing up how much I'm charging blowing up how much I'm committed to the transformation of the women who are participating and what that looks like on a practical level is sponsorship venue booking uh creating the the whole the uh the powerpoints and the slides and what am i going to offer to these women so that they actually really leave feeling all the more transformed so that was a huge that was really uncomfortable for me you I know because you saw the the experience i had in the first one and how i wanted to kill myself <laughs> in having to do it and now being like you know what not only am i doing it but i want to do it in an even bigger bigger way and i think it's common for those of us that are doing big things in the world when we're growing into that bigger container, I think there is a lot of discomfort oh, there. Yeah. And there is a lot of resistance because it's so different. Um, I there's I, I don't know if there's any scientific <clears throat> anything behind this, but I say this a lot with my clients, is that our subconscious brain um, cannot distinguish the different types of fears or resistance that we have in our life. So if you're having resistance to, say, launching a product or something – your brain still processes it the same way as if we were in, you know, the caveman era and you were being chased by a saber-toothed tiger. So it's it's really fascinating when you start looking at things from that level because your resistance to launching this program, you know, your subconscious brain is telling you every single day, we're dying. Yeah. Like, I'm literally dying. I'm not going to make it through this experience. I am going to get killed. Yeah. Yeah, yep, and yep, so yep. that's why it it took Thais making a daily commitment to that discomfort and to that growth to really break through into that bigger container so that she can then use this platform to serve. I mean, and this happened on a physical level last year when I moved to L.A. and I drove across the country all by myself. And I remember so vividly having this conversation with my boyfriend as I was driving. I was like, being uncomfortable and leveling up and, and being in a new space in life is not a one-time decision. Mm -hmm. It's not a, oh, I decided I'm going to make, you know, six figures this year and then that's it. And then kind of put that on a on a on a bench or on a shelf, a shelf. or whatever on a shelf uh, it's a fucking daily commitment to mm -hmm. be that person and to get uncomfortable and to say yes to it daily daily sometimes minute by minute decision because just like what Bree said fear is fear and it feels very real and as I say this to my my clients all the time it is real it's very real to us, and I don't want to ever say that your fears are not real. They are real, even if they may seem illogical or even if they may seem, like, totally blown up. They are very real, but they are not the truth. Mm -hmm. They're not what's true. And asking yourself time and time again, what is true? Am I really going to die from doing this? Is it really going to kill me? It's not. And recommitting again and again to being the type of person that has a type of program that transforms the lives of others in a, in a way that's so powerful that it even blew me away. Yeah. it's I mean, it's really that commitment to being uncomfortable because yeah. that's where true change happens yeah. in life. Yeah. And and this so. happens, you know, I, I know you, this has happened to you. It's like with my clients, I mean, I, I had a client who really wanted to get on camera and kept finding every excuse not to do it. And I finally, it got to the point where I told her the fear is never going to go away until you do it. 
the fear is literally you you can't eft your way out of the fear you know you can't <laughs> yoga your way out of the fear you can try you can try but the fear is going to be there until you take action because action is the antithesis of fear action is what drives that fear into its real reality which is it's not it's not true yeah, yeah. so what about you Bree? what is the most uncomfortable thing you've done in the past month um, I don't know if it's been in the past month, although for me, again, it's been like that regular commitment is um, knowing my value and standing in it. Oh, so that's so hard. It's so hard. Um, really, at the beginning of this year, you know, I have a lot of people that reach out and are like, oh, will you mentor me or can I pick your brain or all of these things? And the hard thing for me is that, you know, I don't sell a physical product. I sell my knowledge. I sell my experience. I sell my expertise. And so for people to reach out to me like that constantly is basically like them asking to use my, you know, all of my investment in my life for free. And so in January was the first time uh, where, you know, luckily I felt backed against the wall. I was in a financial position where I just had to fucking figure something out quick. And I had someone call me and say, I love what you're, you do with your brand and blah, blah, blah. Can I pick your brain? <clears throat> and uh, I responded back to them and said, thank you so much. I'm so grateful that you enjoy, you know, what I've done with my brands and how I've built myself in the world. And you can't pick my brain, um, but here's what it looks like to work with me. And I was fucking terrified. Yeah. Because then what if they had said like, no, you know, and of what course, would they think of you? Like, yeah. that's the whole point. The fear. So this is where my people pleasing gets yeah, in my way. This, this is a very much a people pleasing thing of what will they think of me? Yeah. Will they say no? Will they judge me? Will they think I am blah, 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 blah. Or even still, you know, I have clients that want to work with me in there. They ask, I've had a few people ask if I'll discount my rates for them. Or if I will trade or if, you know, all of these things. And so for me, it's a continual commitment and practice to stand in my value. And I have to say, part of people pleasing is totally normal. Part of our biology was created to, ah, and everything is falling. And everything <laughs> fell uh, on top of my dog. Um, is our biology was created for us to be very well aware of what other people think about us. Because that's how we were kept safe. If we could read the, the what was going on around us, then we can then determine if we're safe or if we should be in fight or flight or freeze mode. And so people pleasing is a normal biological thing. And we get to then choose how much power we give other people over us. Because every time we choose to please others over pleasing ourselves, we are essentially saying, you are more important than me. Your needs are more important than my time or my knowledge or my worth. You is greater than me. Mm -hmm. Versus, not, the opposite is not me greater than you. The opposite is me equals you. My time is worth this much. My value is worth this much. And you can either rise up to that or it's not, it's a no-go. It's not something I'm available for. I will not be less than your needs. And the coolest thing for me in this discomfort and in standing in my value is really what's allowed me to hit multiple, you know, five-figure months this year. Yeah. And really standing in my worth and my value, my expertise, all of these things and really taking that stand and saying, I deserve to be paid X, Y, Z for the amount of transformation that I will provide your company or your, you know, person or your whatever. And um, so, yes, it's uncomfortable. Yes, it's, you know, probably some tearful phone calls to Thais and like, oh, my God, what am I doing? I'm bananas. Like people are going to think I'm crazy, blah, blah, blah. And it's really only what's going to provide me the kind of growth that I want to see on the other side. Yeah. And so part of the work that is important that you do is not to suppress the fear because suppression only leads to depression. Suppression does not work. And so when we suppress the fear, it's like, um, you know, putting a, a pot of boiling water on the stove and then putting something over it. Like eventually it's going to explode. 
like a pressure cooker, right? The top is going to explode. Suppression of fear is not the answer. It is an expression of fear. That's the answer. Like Brie calling me or me calling her and her calling me out. Like that is my expression of the fear. I am expressing that this is coming up for me and that this is okay. It is okay to feel the fear. And this is something I encourage my clients to do all the time. Express it. Do not be fearful of allowing it to be a part of your life. Do not be afraid of who you are. Even these negative parts. Embrace all the shadow, all the fear. And once you have allowed it to express, make sure that you are not taking action based on that expression. Instead, and this is something I know Brie is very passionate about, instead, take action from where you want to be. Mm -hmm. Take action from Mm -hmm. the woman who does not allow this fear to consume her. Well, and take action from the woman that already has the thing that you want. Exactly. That's, uh, That's how you make shit happen in your life. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I've seen it to be so true for me and, and for her. And it's, it's you know, p- again, people pleasing doesn't ever really go away. You just re- you just shift your relationship to it and mm-hmm. it no longer plagues you. I will always care what people think about me because I'm passionate about what I do and I want what I do to land. And I also know that me being authentically me is more important. And I, and I have to say, I'm still learning this. Um, we all are. Because social media likes, it raises our dopamine levels. <laughs> it becomes an addiction. And so what does it look like to be fully me in a world where I want likes? And that's something we're all navigating and we're always learning. And it's, again, it's a daily commitment of who do I want to be in this world? Who do I want to take a stand for? Do I want to take a stand for uh, other people's needs or my my values? What are your values? Get aligned with that. And who do you need to be uh, in order to express those values out into the world? Yeah. All right. Let's bring on our brilliant guest, Billy, and uh, go even deeper about being uncomfortable. Billy and I have known each other for about 18 months, and he is so cool. His mustache alone tells me that he's cool. (laughs) (laughs) So let me introduce you to Billy Anderson. When Billy was five years old, his mom heard him crying in his room. He said, you're born, you live for a while, then you die. What's the point? He's spent the rest of his life figuring it out. The point (laughs) is this. Have the courage to be authentically you all the time and have a shitload of fun while you do it. After years of doing what the world said he should do, Billy redefined his version of success and went after it. He left his successful advertising career, moved into the woods, and led wilderness trips for Outward Bound while leading volunteer projects in Central America and the South Pacific during the winter. Billy's now an international coach international speaker and professional coach. He's the founder of The Courage Crusade, author of Your Comfort Zone is Killing You, and regular contributor to the business section in The Globe and Mail. He also finds time to get way out of his comfort zone so he can grow his courage muscle. He has jumped out of an airplane exactly 101 times. Amazing. He's traveled to over 30 countries, including trekking the Himalayas, running with the bulls in Spain, and swimming with the sharks in South America. He's been a sugarcane farmer in Costa Rica, an apple picker in New Zealand, and a fundraising director for UNICEF. Holy shit. Welcome, <laughs> Billy. <laughs> I usually, Thanks, folks. Happy to be here. I usually don't read such long, like, usually we cut down the bios, but yours was so fucking good. I was like, I can't, I can't cut that down. <laughs> oh, good. That's great to hear. <laughs> so good. All right. So we start off our podcast interviews by asking our guests. So we will ask you, what does it look like for you to live an amplified life? Sure. Yeah, that's a fun, a fun question to answer. So for me, an amplified life um, is to do something scary every day. So I, re- I'm when, when I say scary, it can kind of be anything because in that bio you mentioned the courage muscle, and courage is a muscle. The more you use it, the easier it gets. And I mean, unfortunately, it only gets a tiny bit easier every time, but over time, those add up. So what I find is that. Everything is about having the courage to be yourself. And when we don't do that, we start living a life of shoulds. Like I should do this. I should not do this. And then it's other people's expectations. And we don't bring our amazing self to the world. So every day I try to do at least one thing I'm scared of. Um, And it's more the day-to-day stuff. People are like, oh, I don't want to jump out of planes or I don't want to run with the bulls. It's like, oh, yeah, you don't have to. But what's your equivalent? Like what's your equivalent of jumping out of the plane? And maybe it's – you know, not putting off that conversation anymore. Or maybe it's, you know, you were going to 
charge this much for your next project as an entrepreneur. Well, what if you charged a little bit more? Or what if you went after that big client that you don't think you're qualified for yet? So that's what it is. And it can be as small as, I don't really feel like going to the gym today, and you go. <laughs> so it's getting out of that comfort zone every day, even if it's just a tiny bit. So what's uh, what's something that you've done today or oh yesterday? I was totally just going to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> that <laughs> no, put you out of the comfort zone. Sure. So, yeah, so what it was today was uh, I've considered canceling um, a little program I was going to do next week. Ah. And that is – it's usually it'd be scarier the opposite right it'd be scarier to try to run a program but this is it's scarier because you know i haven't had the uh i've been having trouble getting the right kind of people to come out to it mm-hmm. so i'm thinking you know what maybe i'm just not gonna do it and that's scary because it's like well it's that fear of is, is that a failure did i fail at doing this could i have done something better so even just considering like okay how am i going to decide whether or not i even go ahead and do this that's my scary thing so far today I think that's huge. I mean, I know that Brie and I have talked a lot about we have a certain direction for our business and then we both get this divine download that we we call it divine download, you know, like this idea uh, that we're supposed to do something different. And then it does. It almost feels like, wait a minute, is it a cop out? Or are we failing by changing our minds and saying no to something that we were initially so excited for? So I love that you're bringing that up. Cool, cool. And there's a great – and I – well, you've just touched on something really important there. It's when people are struggling with a decision, myself included, um, you're, it's, you're not clear because it's either fear or fit. So by fit, I mean you're considering doing something that maybe isn't really a fit for who you are and what's important to you. Or it is a fit and you're literally just scared to do it. Mm-hmm. And it can be very hard because your, our ego will try to convince us every time it's a bad fit. When because our ego wants us to stay in our comfort zone all the time, so it'll convince us it's fit every time. When a lot of the time it's just fear, and the best way to do that is you you, you look at your values, and it's like okay, I'm thinking about you know do I keep pushing this event for next week or do I do I say forget it, and then I compare those against my values. It's like okay, my first value is freedom. So does that align better with saying no or with saying yes? And then community, and you get a. Basically, it helps take the fear out of it because then you look at it, it's like, wow, you know, maybe six of my values align better with going ahead and doing it and only one or two align with not doing it. That's fear every time. Otherwise, you would have done it already. Mm, That's awesome. Well, Billy, I know you to be someone that does a lot of crazy shit to like get out of your comfort zone. And I think (laughs) one of my favorite things that I know that you did uh, was you boarded the airplane to come to L.A. in January of this year to come to the Archangel Academy in a onesie. (laughs) Yes, I did. (laughs) Yeah, tell us about that experience. (laughs) Yeah, so again, like I said, it's just I'm always looking for ways to get to flex that courage muscle and get out of my comfort zone. And my biggest Fear, and I think it's the, the biggest fear for most people is what are, what will people think of me? Yeah. So it's not failure, right? Like we're okay. We're okay to fail at home, but fail in front of others, forget it. Mm-hmm. So it was a chance for me just like to go out there and I'm going to look like a goof, right? I got this goofy looking mustache um, and I'm going to wear a onesie. And does that make my stomach turn a bit? Yep. Okay. So I'm going to do it. So it was so much fun. And it's it's such a filter, right? Because the people that I'm probably not going to be a good fit with anyway. They stay away. Right. And the people that I pr- might see eye to eye with or we have similar values, they'll actually come up and talk to you. And it is funny because it was almost always women that came and said <laughs> hi. And the guys, well, just because guys are just like, oh, that's not professional. You know, that's not corporate. I can't go talk to that person. That's just stupid. Whereas inside their inner, ki- their inner kid is like, go talk to him, go talk to him. <laughs> but often they don't have the guts. But that's, I mean, that's, that was it was a bit scary, but <clears throat> one time years ago, um, I dressed up as Cleopatra for a five hour flight. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's amazing. By myself. And I was I was actually gonna do it again for this flight with the onesie to LA, but crossing the border from Canada, I thought, Oh, I I just don't wanna risk anything, so I'll tone it down and I'll just do the onesie. 
<laughs> I love that. Well, you know, and I love the the conversation around the fear of what people will think about me. And I want to dive a little bit deeper into it and, yeah. I, and hear your insights around it because I know that it keeps so many people stuck mm -hmm. when they are so obsessed with what other people think about them. I mean, Brie and I, we, we cuss. That's our general way of expressing <laughs> enthusiasm and passion is we let out an F-bomb and we nice. have serious... <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, and we had serious conversations around this podcast and were we going to cuss on the podcast and what, you know, what would people think about us if we did, especially, you know, the older generation? And is that aligned with who we are? And we ultimately decided yes. But I'm curious, like, what, why do you think that people are so obsessed with what other people think about them and stay so stuck in that fear? Sure, sure. And it's a really simple explanation. It's, t it's all evolution. So um, for thousands and thousands of years, we can't survive on it. We haven't been able to survive individually on our own, right? We have to be part of a tribe. We have to be part of a pack. And so our biggest need is our need to belong. We have to belong or we'll die. And so anything that challenges our ability to belong sets off every red flag in our body. So that's why we don't want to cause a fuss. We don't want to speak out against anything. We don't want to fail at anything because, oh my God, what if I no longer belong? And so that's why we're so scared of what other people think. And that's why, um, you know, you will always assume the worst when we don't have enough information. So you mm. walk into a room, there's a bunch of people in there, they're talking, you walk in and they stop talking instantly our inner caveman or cavewoman says, oh, they're talking about you. You screwed something up and you start going through, what did I do lately? What have I done? What can I do better? When they could be planning a surprise party for you. Yeah. But we're literally, so we're programmed to be that terrified about it because it kept us alive for thousands of years, but now it holds us back. So the fascinating thing I love about this now is, you know, I grew up in the Midwest and I was very clear about the fact that I didn't fit in and that I didn't belong. And for the most part, growing like up until the age of 18, but when I left, I just was the wallflower. Like I just hid and didn't want to talk to anyone, didn't want to be seen. And as you said that just now about um, the tribes, I had this realization where I'm like, I have a tribe now and I can still be myself. And so it's fascinating to think that we limit ourselves because of the current tribe that we're around when maybe it's just not the tribe you're meant to be in. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, for thousands of years, you had one tribe. Yeah. And you, you were in or you were out. Mm -hmm. So it's absolute panic to not feel like you belong. But you're right. Nowadays, you can, you can find your tribe. Um, and it's tricky because up until kind of – I'm generalizing, but like kind of uh, teenage years, like we're all pretty similar. We haven't really figured out what makes us tick and who we really are. Um, and then you get older and you realize, wow, maybe I don't fit in with those people. And that's, and just accepting that that's okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the more we, the more we try to conform and not be ourselves, the more we get, we remain in relationships that aren't the right fit for us and they suck. Yep. And I think that's why we, the minute, it's kind of like when it's, uh, I call them situational friends. Like when you're in camp and you're kind of not, you're forced to make friends with the people around you, you love it and you make friends and it's all great. And then you, you know, by the end of camp, you're like, oh, I promise we'll be in touch. But then yeah. we, we don't, we're not in touch. And I think a lot of it is because we force ourselves to conform to the situation so that people like us, so that we have friends. But the minute, I mean, of course, again, I'm stereotyping. And of course, there's probably many people listening who have continued to stay friends with those people. But in, for a high school, moving from high school to college, that's why I think a lot of us lose contact with our high school friends or our college friends because they were situational friends. And now when we get to express ourselves fully, those people limit us and they're not who we really want to be with. Totally. And it's simply a matter of fit. So it's like you get fired from a job or you get dumped by a spouse. It's a, it's a poor fit and they acted on it before you did. Mm -hmm. And that's it. And once we're adults, we don't change. We just get more clear on who we are. Oh, yes, yes. I couldn't agree more. So can you share a story, Billy, of like, you know, a time when you felt like you didn't fit in and, and how you overcame that and, and or, you know, how you have come out in your confidence in yourself to wear a onesie, you know, to, <laughs> in an airport or or to not feel, you know, like so stuck in people's opinions of you. Sure, sure. And it has been 
my biggest struggle. And of course it has, cause that's why I help people with yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Um, our biggest struggle shows our gift. So it kind of came to a head. Um, I was about 30 and I was in my advertising career, which is, I started in England and then continued in Canada and just realized it wasn't for me. And I was trying to fit this corporate mold, which is what all my friends had done. And my, everyone in my neighborhood, you know, that's the goal. You become a corporate person, you sit at a desk, which is fine if you like it. But I realized it wasn't. And I quit that and I became an instructor for Outward Bound. So I led canoe trips. Um, and that's basically coaching disguised as a canoe trip. And that was kind of the toughest part for me. And it was just realizing that, you know, there's nothing wrong with this advertising career. It just doesn't fit who I am. And it really was, it took about a year to finally make the move after knowing because it was just, I was going against so many things and so much of what I knew. And so that's kind of where it started. And then I just combined with being an adrenaline junkie and the skydiving and all that, I just really started to see that there were opportunities to step out of your comfort zone that are just way more important than that physical skydiving kind of stuff and more in being who um, you want to be. And one of my biggest heroes is Muhammad Ali because nobody... I was just I was just taking a note to ask you because I know you just went to his funeral. So keep I talking did. <laughs> and I wanna I wanna hear all about this. Sure. Yeah, so so same thing. Like nobody that I can think of stood up for who what he thought and who he was more than him without worrying about what people think. And we all worry what people think. Like I wanna be liked by everybody. Of course I do. Yeah. But you kinda gotta push that down and be like, no, who am I being and what kind of person do I want to be? And am I happy with who I'm being? Hopefully everybody will like that because I'm human. But if they don't, screw it. I'm happy. I'm living true to my values. I'm aligned with my life purpose. Hopefully people will like me, but I don't care if they do. So I did I I don't even know if I answered your question or if I went all over the place. No, it was perfect. I love it. So yeah, tell us about attending the funeral and what was that like for you? Yeah, it was it was absolutely awesome as I sit here <laughs> right now with my Muhammad Ali t shirt on. <laughs> um it was amazing because again he, he started as my hero because I love boxing and so that's how it started. But then I got to know more about all this, these things that he stood for and stood up for what he wanted to do. And, and so to be in his hometown um, and see the impact that he had, and I met a bunch of people who knew him when they were kids. So this older lady, like a bunch of people, I hung out in his old neighborhood. Um, and I was like the only white person for miles and I'm meeting all these people and everyone's like don't go west of 9th street whatever you do and I'm like well fuck that I'm going west of 9th street and I had I met the most amazing people and and just to see how much he inspired like the whole the whole city let alone all the people outside but that he did as well just oh my god so amazing to hear people say the great things about him and his humanitarian and uh, things that he did, which not everyone's familiar with. Some people just know him as a boxer. But just to be there and soak it up with the people that he touched probably closer than anybody else was ridiculous. Well, and it's so fascinating because everyone looks at him as this legend and as this boxer and as this adult that's done all these amazing things. And just now, as you were mentioning, the people that knew him as kids, I think that we often forget that we, they have legends. somewhere <laughs> legends have yeah. like you know he was he was a kid once and he was like you said exactly where we all were in high school not knowing who our tribe was or not feeling like we were a hundred percent fitting in and it's just that shift is in just now when we were talking about it um is kind of poignant for me because we don't think of like you know oprah as a, as a child, as a kid. yeah, or yeah. you know, it's it's interesting. So, were were there any insights about his growing up that you learned from anyone, or any stories you heard? Uh, just that he started to question things so young, and I think mm. someone who's as impactful as, as him, um, it starts very, very, very early. <clears throat> and just to hear about, you know, he that him and his brother would be in their room and they'd be chatting about, you know. Um, why is why is life this way or why can't I get served at that restaurant but I can at that one and just that but I think those people that really put a dent in the universe they it starts really really young and it's just it's as much a curiosity as anything um and just being curious and just asking questions and not accepting things just cuz people say it and not going against it just for the sake of it but yeah. just 
just really feeling like what resonates with you and then just kind of deciding, okay, I'm going to try to do something about that. And that's, that's the hard part, especially if you don't have support from your family or your best friends, or again, if it's going to cause you to stand out. Yeah. Oh. I love the question. Why has always been my favorite question from such a young age. <laughs> must like, have driven your parents crazy. Oh, I'm my sure grandparents. I remember. <laughs> so I remember one particular instance with my grandmother. I was at her house and uh, I was using, I was, putting my middle like middle finger up all over everywhere just like flipping people <laughs> off and my grandma was like that's inappropriate you can't do that but you know like all these things and I was like but why grandma like it's, it's like yeah look there it is <laughs> it's just another finger like I I don't why why well it's bad why well because we say it is well why like yeah no I used to drive people freaking crazy I'm sure you did <laughs> A think, lot of people aren't allowed they're not even allowed to ask why sometimes yeah. it's like oh no, no you don't do that and that comes down to you know, parenting skills too, right? And just allowing your kids to ask questions. And it's leadership. I do a lot of corporate leadership coaching and what makes a good leader is exactly the same as what makes a good parent. You ask more questions. I was just going to say, I, I love what you said there. And I want to keep, I want to stay here in this topic because I think this is so powerful. And it's the, what you said about not just curiosity, like have the curiosity and have your, um, keep asking questions, you know, be curious about the why things are the way they are and just be open to the answers and be open to having it change and having you be that change maker. I think that's so powerful, Billy because I think our sense of curiosity, kind, and I'm sure you found this to be true, kind of stops being a part of our lives when we start reaching an age where we start understanding the way things are. You know, like I understand why I pay my taxes. I understand where the money, you know, sort of kind of goes. And I kind of get why we have the system of taxation. You know what I mean? Like, because yeah. I now know the system, I stop asking the questions. And I think that that's such a detriment to creating new, new systems and new ways of being which is by asking questions totally and i think what's that i don't know who said it but some kind of quote like um in the beginner's mind there are endless possibilities and in the expert's mind there's only one yes and i think mm -hmm. as we get older we I get we spend that. so much more time knowing what we're doing yeah you know we get into a career that we want to do or we're good at and we keep doing it and we get better and better and better and better and we we have less time in life where we just don't know what's going on yeah. and so we forget we 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 we're not used to being in that. It's like you teach a little, teach a baby how to swim. It's not that big a deal. But you teach an adult how to swim, forget it. They make up every, every excuse in the book because we just forget to not, we forget to spend time not knowing. Yeah, yeah. And this is so good because, you know, you are a speaker and a coach. And so I found in the beginning of my business, because I've been in, in the coaching business for about four years, that in the beginning of my business, I felt like I had to be perfect and I had to know all the answers in order for me to be a coach. And I had to position myself as being the know-all in order for people to take me seriously. Did you ever experience that? Yeah, of course. And, and I remember <laughs> totally. And it's one of the best lessons that like oh, high yeah. school kids can ever hear is that you know, because when you're at a young age, we think, oh, you know, what, eventually you're going to get to a point and you have all the answers. Yeah. And it's so not true. Like the more challenges you take on, the less answers you have. Like I have days where I know what I'm doing maybe 10% of the day. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And if you always know what you're doing, you're coasting. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember in advertising, the head of the company had all the new people in and said, and I was pretty junior at this point, and he said, I'm scared all the time. And this is the very successful president of the company. And it's such a good message to learn because otherwise we all walk around. We all want to look perfect because we all want to fit in and belong. Mm -hmm. So we all have all this suffering going on in our head and our inner critic and telling us we're not good enough. And question, But none of us talk about it because God forbid we don't look like we've got our act together. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of like even, hey, we're going out for dinner tonight, tomorrow night. You want to come? And almost nobody will admit they just don't have the money for it. They're like, oh no, I'm really busy, uh, really busy lately. But it's it's even that thing around money is like it's like almost like a sin to say you're broke right now. It's like, yeah. but then as soon as you say it, someone else in the group is, oh no, good call. I don't have any money either. Yeah. But they yeah. won't lead with it, and it's like, oh, I've got we got this presentation tomorrow. It's like, how are you guys feeling? I'm kind of scared. Like, oh, you're scared too. I'm totally scared. But until you open that door, we'll just pretend everything's okay. 
Yeah. And yeah. it eats us up inside. Mm -hmm. Well, so I remember when you're saying, you know, this is a great lesson for high school students. When I was younger, um, my mom worked at a college. And so when I was six, I was growing up around all these college students. So I would look at these 18 to 21 year olds and be like, oh, my God. They're adults. They know everything. They know everything. They're everything. settled in life. Yeah. And so, like, they're so old and uh, they're wise and all this stuff. And then I got to college and I, like, kind of looked around and I was like, I don't really feel like I thought they felt. Yeah. And so I was yeah. like, I must be doing this wrong. And even coming into adulthood, you know, I look at myself now. My When my mom was my age, she had a six-year-old. And I'm like, I look at that and I'm like, there's no way. Like, how did she have it all together? And oh, for sure. You know, we look at people and we tell these stories about who they are or what their what their experience is based on this perception of them, but we don't actually look at the real experience that they're having. And then we tell stories about who we are because we're not where they were, except we didn't actually know where they were. Because yeah. it's like such a vicious cycle. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I've worked with like hundreds of people one on one and you get pretty, pretty deep um, and you figure out their fears and all that. And everybody has one, their kind of biggest, biggest, biggest limiting belief. And it comes from their childhood, comes from mm -hmm. mom or dad every single time. And it holds them back for their entire life mm -hmm. and you have to figure out kind of what that is. And then, and then you're constantly working. So mine is don't be yourself or people will think you're a goof. Yeah. And everyone has, it. and I've coached CEOs and they have it and they have fears as well. And as soon as you shut the door and they know that everything they say to you is confidential, they just open up. And this is the people, this guy who, or the girl who runs the company and all the junior people are like, Oh my God, they always have the answer. They always know what's going on. Not a chance. If you're running a company and you always have the answer, you are going out of business because yeah. it's not that easy. Yeah. Well, I remember when I moved to LA a year ago, I'm going to get really vulnerable for a hot second here. Awesome. Um, I thought I couldn't be friends with anybody that I was meeting because I wanted them to see me as a coach and that if they saw me as a friend, they would never hire me. Okay, so I yeah. alienated myself for a good for you know the first three months, and every person that I would meet, I would try to like position myself as the expert, you know, and and speak yeah. in such a way that made me look perfect because I was terrified that I was making all these friends and I was gonna have no business, and it all comes down to that fear I had of people weren't going to hire me because of who I am. I have to be more of an expert. I have to write in a different way. I can't be myself. I can't cuss. I can't, you know, right. have a loud laugh. I can't use the word like or the people that general that I work with are in their 30s and 40s. So they're a little bit older than me. And I thought I had to be all this way. And it was a very alienating experience. I felt very alone. Of and course. It, it took you're not being authentically yourself. Yeah. And so I'm sure you can guess, Billy, it's not like I was loading on the clients. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I had to really decide that there was, I was going to believe another story and I was going to believe that I can be friends with somebody. And if they decide that they want to hire me as a coach, I would easily be able to shift into that, which I can. And ever since I shifted that belief, it's amazing what has transpired in my life. So I, I just fucking love this conversation. I'm so glad that you're bringing this conversation to where it is. Cause I think so many of us get so stuck in believing that we have to be a certain way in order to be considered X. X, Y, Z. Absolutely. And it's the key to unhappiness to kind of give into that. Oh, totally. um, and the more you're yourself, and I'm sure you found this, the more you're authentically you, like you said, the more you attract the right people and the more you scare off the people that aren't a good fit anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's, Which it's is scary. Brilliant. <laughs> oh, it is. It's just, the, it's the easiest way to get the right people. Just be yourself. Yep. And so I people have, love oh, it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Matt. Sorry. I have one last question for you. Yeah. So I read in their bio that you've jumped out of a plane 101 times. Yes. So I want to know, what was the first time like? And what was the 101th time like? Is that a word? <laughs> and how are they different? And cool. ha have you learned anything in Fun. the 100 times in between? Yes, absolutely. So just like the courage muscle, right? It's the same with skydiving. Every single time you do it, it gets a tiny bit easier. The hundred and first time, the last time I went, was probably scarier than the first. Wow. Because, Do yeah, and I'll, explain, I'll explain what 
I'll explain why. Because the first one, it's scary, but you're just so excited. Like, oh my God, I'm jumping out of a plane. I've always wanted to do this. The all the, Then all the way up to 100, it got a bit easier every time. But then I took two years off. So that muscle, the skydiving courage muscle, hadn't been used for two years. So what, and that's what happens with courage as a muscle. If you stop using it, it starts to atrophy. So I went mm. up a hundred, a hundred and first time and I was like, okay, it's been two years. Like, have I forgotten some stuff? Like, what do I do? Which do I pull at what time? And what if this happens when I fall? And what if they, they do this and that happens there? And I just started talking myself into it. And that was kind of the biggest reinforcement of that courage as a muscle is it's a muscle. You have to keep using it or it shrinks back mm. to, the way, to the way it was before. I love that. So listeners, if you want to be ripped, uh, Billy's tip is <laughs> that uh, in order to get a six pack, you just have to be courageous every day. It's fine. Damn right. <laughs> and don't let don't let two years pass. Yeah. Otherwise, you'll lose your six pack. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> I love that. And I love how you make uh, courage so relatable. And mm -hmm. so something that we all know, which is like a muscle, we all know how the muscle works. And I say, you know, willpower is a muscle. And I love that you're using courage as a muscle. I think that what you do is so inspiring and so empowering. And I'm so, so happy to have you on and to have this conversation with you, Billy. Yeah, this has been awesome. I mean, I could talk about this forever. So <laughs> thank you for allowing me to be on here. And Share the learning and the love and all that stuff. Well, where can people find you if they want to connect with you deeper? Yeah, simplest is to go to my site, which is couragecrusade.com. And what will pop up right away is my values assessment online. And that's really where it starts because you can – through that, you'll define your 10 values, the 10 things that are most important to you. And then it's literally you see where the fits are and aren't in your life because it takes the emotion out and says, well, this is what's important to you. Why are you with that? person they don't align with any of those so that's a great sort of introduction i actually think i need to do that <laughs> oh everybody should everybody should i'm doing it with a company right now the canadian olympic committee um helping the whole company redefine their values and all 100 people in the company are doing the assessment and then we're gonna combine them all it's kind of cool i love yeah, it well fun. we're gonna add that to the show notes so if yeah. you are listening you can find that in the show notes one last question billy where can people yeah. get your comfort zone is killing you Nice. My book. So it's on Amazon. So awesome. yeah, amazon.com cool. or amazon.ca we'll if you're in, the, in Canada. Yeah. And I think if I remember correctly, it, the front cover is an ostrich with its head buried in the sand. Yes. Uh, <laughs> see, it is amazing how like you can see something in passing and it sticks with you so much. Very that, cool. Like, now when I think of you, that's just like, that is just what I, what I see. I love it. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you, Billy. We love you. And we're so grateful to have spent uh, the last half hour with you. Um, as you always, guys lucky as well. As always, you can find us at theamplifycollective.com on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat at The Amplify Co. And if you're in LA, be sure to check out our events. We always have multiple events every month. And we will see you or hear you, I guess, next week on Be Amplified. And until then, have an amplified life, baby. Yeah. Woo.